Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise today to support the NDP Opposition Day motion to designate microbead plastics as toxic under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. These, of course, as people will know from following the debate now, were originally found in cleansers, and then uh, about 10 years ago, they moved into a wide variety of personal care products. So what's the problem with them? The, the government side doesn't seem to con be convinced that there's any science or any evidence that there's a problem here. But what happens is that microplastics absorb pollutants in the water, things such as DDT, PAH, PCBs. And so when those toxins are absorbed by the microplastics, they tend to bioaccumulate in the food chain. So it means they become more concentrated as they work their way up the food chain. Now, many colleagues here have talked about the concentrations of these microbead plastics in the Great Lakes. I want to talk about the situation on the West Coast, since I represent an island, a southern Vancouver Island riding. Uh, last year, Peter Ross, who now works at the Vancouver Aquarium, released his research on concentration of microbead plastics on the Pacific Coast. He did 34 water samples from the Salish Sea, around Vancouver, around Victoria, and then also offshore uh, and at the north end of Vancouver Island. And his findings were really quite shocking. Now, Peter Ross is a much cited research scientist. Uh, he was formally employed by Fisheries and Oceans Canada as the director of their Pacific Ocean Pollution Unit. But what happened in 2012 is that this government decided to completely eliminate the capacity of the Canadian federal government to check for pollution on the West Coast. So not only was Peter Ross laid off, but all eight other members of the, the West Coast Ocean Pollution Unit were laid off. So now we have no ability as the federal government to actually check for the impacts of these microbead plastics that the government members are standing and saying, where's your evidence? Well, they eliminated the ability to collect that evidence in 2012, and I think it was deliberate. Since then, the Vancouver Aquarium, a private foundation, has hired Peter Ross, and they're funding their own ocean pollution studies because they feel, obviously, as an aquarium and doing public education, they think this is essential work that somebody has to pick up now that the federal government has dropped the ball. So what did uh, Peter Ross find? It's actually quite shocking. Uh, in the sample which had the highest concentration of these microbead plastics, he found 9,180 particles per cubic meter of water. 9,180 particles per cubic meter of water. The lowest he found, over 100 kilometers offshore of Vancouver Island, was eight. So even far offshore, there were still microbead plastics uh, in the ocean. In the Strait of Georgia, uh, the Salish Sea, he found an average of 3,210 particles per cubic meter. So why am I concerned about that? Well, let me, let me talk very simple terms about how it works around Vancouver Island. Plankton ingest the particles. The plankton are eaten by herring, the herring are eaten by salmon, and the salmon are eaten by the orcas. And so people will know that I've been a uh, advocating for two years that we have an action plan to protect the southern resident killer whales off Vancouver Island. So this is part of the problem. This ocean pollution and microbe plastics are part of the problem in trying to ensure the survival of the orcas. Am I being an alarmist? Well, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans says there's a 50% chance of extinction of the southern resident killer whales by the end of this century. A 50% chance. That's Fisheries and Oceans' own figures. So what are we doing? Uh, the government designated the southern resident killer whales as endangered in 2003. That's 12 years ago. It took them, both liberals and conservatives, I have to say, until March of 2014 to produce a draft action plan. Not an action plan, a draft action plan. And last March, again, over a year ago, they asked stakeholders who were concerned about the fate of the southern resident killer whales and this problem of pollution, which is one of the large parts of the problem, to make comments. And we've heard nothing from the government since then. It's a year later. And the last statement I got in a letter from the minister saying, spring, we'll, we'll be talking to those who submitted com comments in the spring of 2015. Now, I know it doesn't feel like spring here in Ottawa, but I'm from Vancouver Island, and we're well into spring on Vancouver Island. So I convened my own meeting of the stakeholders uh, last Friday night to bring them together and say, what did you tell uh, the federal government that needed to be done, and what can we do? What can all of us do at the local level to try and get started on an action plan? So you'll be hearing more about that later. But it was very successful in that we had uh, whale researchers, whale scientists, uh, pollution experts, 
the Northwest Wildlife Preservation Society education experts. Uh, we had the South Island Anglers Coalition. We had the Dogwood Initiative. We had the Rain Coast Conservation F Foundation. So you get the idea of who was in the room. And everybody recognizes we have a crisis with the southern resident killer whales. Everybody, even the federal government, recognizes the crisis. The problem is we don't get any action. And with the uh, Department of the Environment facing cuts up to 30% in this next budget round, it's very difficult to see how they're going to take the kinds of actions that are necessary to ensure the survival of the southern resident killer whales. In, uh, now, there's been some good news, and I want to address that because sometimes people get overly optimistic. We have had three new calves born to the southern resident killer whales. One of those, though, uh, did not survive, and the mother, a breeding female, also died. Why did they die? The initial tests on the whales indicate they starved to death. Why do they starve to death? There's a problem with food supply in Chinook salmon, but there's also a problem with the microbead plastics in that when they're ingested by marine life, they think they're full when they're getting no nutrition. And so we have a serious and direct connection between microbead plastics and the problems we're facing with southern resident killer whales. So we focus on the good news of calves being born. Since 1998, <coughs> 39 orca calves have been born and survived. So that sounds pretty good, except since 1998, 61 orcas have gone missing or died. So we're now down to a total of 79 southern resident killer whales. And as I said, fisheries and oceans are themselves admitting that there's a 50% chance of the extinction of these iconic beings on the south coast of the island. So what can we do about that? Uh, in October of 2013, I put a motion before the House to implement a recovery strategy for the southern resident killer whales. And what it said was, we need continuing support for research and monitoring programs. That's what's in the federal government's draft plan. So I'm not arguing with that part. We need to monitor things like the pollution that microbead plastics are causing. However, that's all that's in the government's draft plan. Instead, the uh, second part of my plan, which I worked out with stakeholders, was to implement programs to decrease the pollution in the Salish Sea. What is one of those things? Eliminating the microbead plastics. So this motion applies very directly to the strategy we need to save the southern resident killer whales. In addition to that, uh, we called for a ban on cos cosmetic pesticide use in home gardens. I was very proud when I sat on city council uh, in Eswamalt before I came here that we did this in our municipality. We eliminated the, the cosmetic use of all of those. And what happened is very interesting. The retailers are stopping stocking those toxic chemicals that people were using on their yards. Good. And one of, one of my favorite things that happened when we were doing this campaign was we lived in a townhouse at that time. My neighbor came over and he said, what about all that grass growing between the, the bricks? He said, we thought we'd go together and we'd buy some pesticides. And he started talking slowly and he goes, I think I'm talking to the wrong person, right? Because I had introduced the motion to get rid of cosmetic use of pesticides. And I said, you know what? You should be talking to your pregnant wife. Do you really want to put pesticides down on your driveway when your kid is born, your kid will be crawling on? Yeah. And we had a very good conversation about what people can do themselves. So in, while we're waiting for this government to take some action to ban microbead plastics, consumers can have a look at the products they're buying and they can start favoring those companies who've already favored out or phased out the use of microbead plastics. Uh, we also called for the, uh, in my strategy, an expansion of the chemical registry list to include all of those kinds of pollutants that are harmful to the southern re resident killer whales. Now I see I'm, I'm running out of time and, and the speaker knows I could go on for a long time here because I think this is very urgent and this opposition day motion feeds into what I've been trying to get action from the government on. Uh, the last part of my, two parts of my strategy dealt with noise levels. Uh, whales are easily dis disturbed by noise when they're trying to feed because they use sonar to try and track their food sources. Uh, and the last, of course, is measures to improve the Chinook stocks because for some reason the orcas around southern Vancouver Island are very fussy eaters. They prefer Chinook. And so do most of the people. And so what we need to do is not fight over the last fish with the whales, but make sure we take action to increase those fish stocks and that we take action like this motion which will make sure that those fish stocks don't include the toxins that bioaccumulate from these microbead plastics. 
So, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to stand in support of this motion today. I see it as a part of what we must do to protect the environmental heritage for all of those to come in Canada, and in particular to prevent the extinction of southern resident killer whales. Thank you. Here, 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 here.